Hello and welcome again to another exciting edition of Victory Never Sleeps. Uh, it This last week has gone by quick. It's hard to believe it's been a week since I've talked to you guys. Um, it's going to be an exciting show tonight. We've already got a packed chat room and this is going to be an interesting episode because of our uh, of our heroes, I think this one is the one that we're going to have the most the most current and the closest to our time as far as information and stories. And I'm not sure uh, Sarah's situation, but I never got to meet the folk mother. But I know people who have. So at least we're a step closer than a lot of our heroes that are further back or that uh, are poorly documented. So I think this will be an interesting show tonight. Um, it's a very timely show because uh, I'm flying out of here tomorrow and this weekend is the third annual Elsie Fest in Wisconsin, which our guest tonight, Sarah and her husband, James, are hosting and they've hosted the previous two years as well. Uh, it's a fantastic event. I will say this, I've been to lots and lots of these events and this is one of the only ones we're doing lately that doesn't happen to be at one of our Hoffs. But used to be doing events at a camp or at another facility was kind of our our standard thing for all the events we did. And yeah, I think uh, I think the alts run a run a much tighter and top notch event compared to any of the other ones I've ever been to. It really works out well. They both do a great job. They're friends they have helping them do a great job. And I'm excited about the fish boil. Um, <laughs> at any of these events, I've got to eat last. I've always got to be the last guy in line. So. I, I'm very hopeful that uh, that I'm going to get some fish boil and anybody who happens to be in front of me, please keep that in mind. <laughs> um, look, so yeah, I'm looking forward to that. That's this weekend. Um, if anybody wants to be there, if anybody's in Wisconsin, if anybody can get to Wisconsin, let's make that happen. Reach out to your folk builder to get vetted. And uh, I would love to see you guys there. Um thinking of any other things we have at the top of the show. Uh, once again, this is being broadcast live on Odyssey, VK, YouTube, uh, Twitter, and over on Entropy. And if you guys want to get your questions to the front of the line, we already got questions stacking up. So if you want to do the super chat and get your questions up front, come over to Entropy and, and donate and we can do that. If you guys just want to donate and help us out, uh, we appreciate any of any and all of y'all's generosity on that. Um, yeah, I think that's where we're at. I think it's also worth noting that next month and uh, Nick will throw up the link and the exact dates for it, but middle of next month at Odin's Hall, we're going to be celebrating Midsummer. That is the oldest of our national events. That is the the district event for Odin's Hall district. It is typically and always has been our biggest event. Winter Nights came really, really close last year. It was within 10 of uh, of Midsummer at Odenshof, which it was a record-breaking Midsummer at Odenshof last year, but usually one of our biggest. It's great. Uh, we'd love to have you guys come out to Odenshof. So anybody who can do that, it's in Brownsville, California. You got time. So um, let your folk builders know about that. And also, I don't think it's too too far out to give you guys a heads up in July, we will be celebrating the first annual Sigur Bloat at Sigurheim. Now it's going to be kind of rustic. It's a, it's a long-term project. We don't have a lot of our infrastructure built there yet, but it's an amazing place. It's very special to us and we're going to be having folks out there and that's going to be in July. So if you guys can do that or want to do that also, please reach out to your local folk builder. They'll get you all taken care of. Without further ado, and we're gonna we're gonna pause for a second on the main subject because this is uh, folk builder Sarah Alt's first time joining us on the program. Sarah, can you introduce yourself to folks and tell them a little bit about who you are, what you do for the AFA, and if you could also tell them a little bit about how you came to Austru and how you came to the Austru Folk Assembly, please. Um. So my name is Sarah Alt. Um, I am a folk builder in Wisconsin. Um, I joined the AFA about four, maybe five years ago now. Uh, my husband had already been a member 
and he was very happy with he was making these trips up to Minnesota to hang out with the Northern Blood Kindred and folk builder Jason Gallagher. And he would just come home so happy about this. And um, a lot of the other things that him and I had been involved in in the past with like the the white national movement, he wasn't always happy about that. And it was just very nice to see him happy. And I went up to Minnesota um, for one of the events at Jason Gallagher's house. This was before Balderstaff was existed. And I was welcomed with open arms. Uh, Jessica Hansen and Githia Anna Plord were amazing and welcoming to me. And they made sure that that I understood that I was welcome there and that as a woman I was accepted. And that's you don't get a lot of that in the white national movement because that is a very manly thing and women are a rarity in that. So it was nice to have that environment and to have families. There were a lot of kids and it was very welcoming. Um, I had also seen a lot of pictures from Odenshoff with um, Mark McLeod and his family and to see generations in the AFA, to see the bloats that were taking part to the old gods. This was something that I really wanted to get involved in. So I joined and then um, my husband became at that time something called there was something called an event coordinator which was a step beat before apprentice folk builder so he was doing moots in the state and he wasn't getting he would get the same handful of men <laughs> that that weren't really interested in joining the afa they just wanted to sit around and drink beer like, i want the family i want that aspect of it and um so he asked me, you know, what do you think we can do? And I was like, well, let's make it family oriented, take it out of the bars, take it out of that kind of environment and put it in parks, things that people would want to bring their children to. And let's go from there. So he had his first very successful <coughs> moot in a park. We fed everybody. We just said, come, we have a lot of food fed everyone and we had so many people join out of that and it just took off in Wisconsin at that point. And at some point after he became an oath folk builder, after we did the first Elsie Fest, I contacted Matt and I was like, I have some questions about folk building and I would just like to know. And so he sent me um, a list of things that folk builders builders at that time were required to do. And I took about almost eight months to think about it because I take commitments very seriously. And at one point I was just like, yes, this is the time. So about eight months after that, I became an apprentice. I was oath at this last fall fest up at Baldershoff and it was an amazing emotional experience. Um, I love the AFA. I love the things that are going on in the AFA. Um, if you get me started on subjects like the Osseter Academy, I can talk for hours because it is amazing what just one program like that did for the growth of the AFA, for the growth of families, for retaining families and teaching our next generation. And I'm so proud of what Gothi Stam and the rest of the staff have created in that academy. So that's one of the things I'm involved with. And then recently I joined up with Githia Sheila McNallan to who had noticed that the older people in the AFA, those like over the age of 50, she wanted them to become more bonded and more realize that they were part of the AFA. So so she asked me to help her with that. So we have that going on. We have a group on MeWe. She sends out emails to keep up with everyone. And we do a meeting every Friday. And it is so interesting listening to these people who have been one members of the AFA from the beginning talk about the way it has grown, their lives, what they remember also true was years and years ago. And I've just learned so much from these people. And that has been very enjoyable. Um, 
I'm part of the Ruinstone staff. So if you get those every month, you should really open them and read them because they are filled with so much information about the AFA. It, it is so interesting to be able to put these in every month. So I get to read them from all four districts. There is so much going on on a weekly basis in the AFA that most people don't even realize. There's really very little excuse not to get out among your folk. Um, let's see, what else do I do? Uh, I help uh, folk builder Nick Rice with the uh, Baldersoft website, which you should check out because it's really awesome looking and has a ton of information, um, not only on Baldershoff, but on the folk mother, because there is a, a memorial for her, an altar to her at Baldershoff. Uh, I do a book study um, three times a month with Witten Brandy Callahan. Right now we are working on Beowulf, and I encourage all, it's just for ladies, and I encourage all women to to either listen to the recordings or come to that. There is, she shares such a wealth of information. The last book study I did with her on deep ancestors went on for a year and a half because there's so many rabbit holes she goes down and you learn so much from her. Uh, and on Tuesday nights, I do a lore study with Melissa Mills and that has been an incredible experience. Gothy, Jason Plord is such a wealth of information in that you can come, you can ask questions. We read the lore together. And at the end of the month, Melissa runs a trivia contest where we go over everything we've studied and you have a chance to win prizes. And it really has helped each of us learn so much. And I'm sure I'm forgetting something, <laughs> but I guess, <laughs> That's a lot, and <laughs> I keep busy. I, I do. <laughs> well, so, and and I'm sure you are forgetting stuff, but I think that illustrates that you do a lot for us, and uh, you you always have such an amazing attitude about it. I think everybody on here can just hear in your voice the attitude you bring to it, and I think that's a really beautiful thing. You're, I remember it was really emotional oathing you all in, and there was a number of people, but you specifically you gave me one of the best hugs after that. And I just, it was really cool oathing you in, and it's great having you on the team. Thank you. Um, so without further ado, assuming that our audience has never heard anything about her before, can you tell us? What do we need? To, and we'll have more questions and stuff to dig deeper later. But what should folks know about Elsie Christensen? Um, she is definitely an amazing lady. So I'm just going to go over some of the basics. And then later on, we can dive deeper into um, why she is truly the folk mother of Ossature. OK, so she was born in Denmark in 1913. And she was originally as a Lutheran as a child but she never felt that connection to Christianity. Um, and she even went as far as petitioning the government to declare her a non-Christian. She married Alex Christensen in 1937. He was a woodworker by trade and she worked as a hand weaver until she injured her back and then she moved on to teaching children and adults with dyslexia. Alex had introduced her to a political concept which is centered on the idea that power corrupts and any elite ruler that cannot be ethically justified must be dismantled. This, called her, this caused her to join the Strasserlite National Bolshevik faction of the Danish National Socialist Party. Now, she was not a communist. A lot of people see the word Bolshevik attached to her and she just, she wasn't. She just believed the, the idea that foreign capitalism being involved in government was a disservice to the people. Um, so she basically agreed with all the ideas of national socialism except economics and governing. For the most part during the German occupation, they lived very well due to Alex's wood, woodworking. 
Since few had his talents, his services were in high demand by the wealthy. With the cash coming in, they could buy whatever they wanted on the black market, including guns and ammo. However, because of their allegiance to the Strasolite fraction, that caused them to be under heavy scrutiny, which is why they had several visits by the German police. Since citizens owning weapons was outlawed, this included a visit due to a tip that they had pistols, pistols in their possession. She cooperated with them because she knew it was easier and they wouldn't search the house. She handed over the pistols they had asked for because if they would have searched the house, they would have found all the other weapons she had, including a belt-filled machine gun. Near the end of the war, Elsie and her husband were called in for questioning due to their political beliefs. She was held for less than 10 hours and Alex was sent to a con concentration camp for six months. The Germans had zero tolerance for any communistic ideas, including those in the Strasolite fraction of the Danish National Socialist Party. National Socialism was all encompassing and had no room for Bolshevik ideas on governing. After the war, they bought a large sailboat, which they had intended to sail to Canada. But the weather had not permitted, and they ended up migrating to Canada in 1951. They were living in Toronto. She worked as a waitress and struggled to learn the language. Eventually, she worked as an x-ray technician and assistant to the head of a hospital until she retired. Elsie recalled being introduced to the writings of Australian Odinist Alexander Rudd Mills. She started writing Alexander Rudd Mills until his passing and continued to correspond with his wife, Evelyn Price, until her passing. Elsie was heavily influenced by ideas, his ideas about reviving the worship of the ancient Norse deities. In 1968, Elsie and her husband started the Odinist study group with meetings in their home. A year later, they would form the Odinus Foundation and move to Crystal River, Florida. She began touring North America to promote Odinism. Then in 1970, the Odinus Foundation was born. She started reaching out to three prisons in Florida. She recalled that the study groups were small and she was the first to have Odinism recognized by any prison system. While working in the prison, she never had any misconceptions about her purpose there. She recognized that most prisoners were rotten apples, but she held onto the fact that a small handful would come out and do great things. She said of her prison work, no packed rooms in the prison. In each institution, I only have a few people, occasionally about a dozen, but five to six is more common. I certainly do not want the fellowship to be a club for cons or ex-cons. The advantage for a person is that when in prison, the inmates have time to discuss and digest what they read, a point that is often lost to people on the outside in the hubbub of daily concerns. In 1971, Alex passed away, and it is the same year the first publication of The Odinist was released. This publication took off like wildflower especially in the prison system. She continued building Odinism and published the Odinist up until her death on May 4th, 2005. On Odinism, she said, to understand my approach to Odinism, one simply has to realize that only when one knows all the aspects of an ideology can one choose wisely. If you only know half of it, you're out of balance. She also wrote, Odinism to the consternation of many people. Odinist as well as non-Odinist is not dogmatic. We will have to agree upon and tolerate several main interpretations of Osetru Odinism. Eventually, I believe it will all come together. Although I, at present, do not deal with rituals and ruin lore, I'm certainly aware of both and agree that they are part of our ancient religion. I'm simply not able to deal with them, so I leave them be until somebody appears who can do so in any way I can accept as the closest to the real thing when my instincts tell me they are. Elsie Christian was bestowed with the title Folk Mother due to her devotion to rebirthing Osichu after picking up the torch from Alexander Rudd Mills. 
Most of those who have since come to the reawakening probably would not have done so had it not been for her. Her dedication to bringing people back to their ancestor roots, especially those in prison, is something that should inspire us all. One of my favorite quotes from Elsie is from 1992. We're all more and less caught up in the speed of modern society. We have just wit witnessed the Olympics where a fraction of a second makes the difference between a win or a loss. But in life, you're not in competition with anyone but yourself. You're not out to win medals. You're here as a member of your folk. And your efforts are not counted in seconds in competition with other people, but rather in the quiet, continuous influence you have on the overall future in the life of our folk. The Ossetry Folk Assembly holds a day of remembrance for the folk builder on the 9th of May. And there is a memorial altar dedicated to her at Baldershof, the third half of the AFA. Well, thank you for that. That's already more than more than we've got on our uh, our other heroes that we celebrate. A couple of points that I that I want to point out on that. Um, first, uh, I guess going last to last to first or whatever. Her comment about her lack of doing uh, rune work, or ritual work. I came across a letter of correspondence between her and uh, Steve McNallan early on. And that was one of the really interesting points in there because she fully acknowledged that um, she wasn't doing a lot of, of ritual and, and more esoteric work and that Steve was. And so that was one of their, their points of, of interaction over the years was, you know, she acknowledged that Steve was filling the religious function that that she, you know, just wasn't equipped to do at that time. And so that that was some of the early connections between her and what would become the Austria Folk Assembly. And I think this letter was from the 1980s. Um, also, <clears throat> something interesting to know, and I know it, the crucible of political ideologies in the 1920s, 30s, and, and 1940s is really hard to unravel because especially, you know, even within the more right-wing political circles of Europe, there was a big spectrum of political ideologies, both economically and ruling and other things. And something else that I want people to know is the significance of Elsie is in her contribution to our faith. You'll notice that, you know, I, I don't think that I, I would agree with a lot of her, her political ideology when it came to, when it came to elitism or when it came to authority or when it came to different things. But what was so special is she was one of the most, you know, one of those very early people that went out and did this or the proto version of this when nobody else around her was. Um, the efforts that she started in her prison ministry blossomed to where I went to do prison ministry at uh, a high desert uh penitentiary up in up around Susanville, California. One now there was one guy that wasn't, I don't know whether he was in bad graces or whatnot, but on the two yards that I did uh did the prison ministry on, 100 percent of the white prisoners there claimed to practice Alcetry. So you know when when her things were poorly attended, that grew exponentially for us over the decades. Um, I'm checking because I'm getting a little bit of an echo, but we've got some questions stacking up and I'll say this. It's really great to have, to have people as closely connected and as devoted to this particular hero. Um, oftentimes our heroes are not appropriately celebrated and get forgotten and it, 
is really nice. And we'll see that throughout the questions, throughout the discussion, I already see that stacking up, but just how much you, uh, you do to preserve the memory of the folk mother and to celebrate and to honor her. Um, it's really beautiful. And I want to see that for, for all of our heroes. And it's really cool that you do that. And really quick, one thing you reminded me of as you were talking is if you read the issues of the Odinist, the, the older ones, you have to remember that at that time, that is what she knew. But her, as all of us, as we grow in knowledge, she, over the years, there were some things about her that, that changed and her feelings on different things. Now, I'm, I'm often asked if I think that Elsie would be a member of the AFA today. And I can't answer that, obviously, because she's no longer with us. And it's a different AFA today than it was when she was alive. I do know she never joined under Stephen McNallan. She did send people who were interested in rituals and learning that kind of thing that he was doing. She sent people to him because she she admired and respected him. But obviously, I, I, I don't know. I, I'd like to think she would. But... So I would absolutely love to conquer the entire world of Alcatru and have them all under the trihorns because I believe it's the right thing to do and the right way to go. Uh, do I think Elsie would have necessarily joined the AFA? I don't know because uh, minds can change. Do I think if magically we brought back Elsie from the day she died to see if she would join? Probably not, but I would still love to invite her to everything we did and I would be so honored if she came to it. Yeah, definitely. Um, and hopefully we'd have the discussions and she would, but I can't, I can't put that on her or her memory and I wouldn't try to. Yeah. Um, but there are a lot of people that were at different levels of their spiritual development that laid the foundation for us. And I think it's really important to look at, especially um, our heroes from the, the 19th and the 20th century that came before us because our, our Alcatru has evolved quite a bit yes, it is. and it, and it should. And I hope very much that they will be proud of what we've done. Um, again, I can't put that on them and I'm not going to go back in time and put words in people's mouths. That's not right, mm -hmm. but I hope that they'd be proud of it. And it's important for us to look back and appreciate the steps that they made instead of criticize things that we think with, you know, a hundred years hindsight, we would have, would have, could have, should have done differently. Um, because whatever, you know, the steps that they took were what allowed us to, to be where we are today. And that's extremely valuable. And hindsight is always 2020 and things look real different when, uh, when it's in the here and now and not armchair quarterbacking the past. Our first question of the night from uh, Gothi Trent East. Question for both Sarah and the Alls Harrier Gothi. Which god or goddess do you feel closest to and why? Sarah, which god or goddess do you feel closest to and why? Uh, Frigga. Um, I, I totally skipped over how I came to Ossature, but um, I had a, a deep connection with the Celtic goddess Bridget before coming to Ossetru. And with the mother aspect that I saw in her is the same thing that I see in Frigga. And with the sto story of Frigga and her son Balder, with me it resonates that you try to protect your child from everything possible in the world, but in the end you cannot change the, the you cannot protect them from where their destiny is taking them. And that is why I relate to her. So I honestly feel, feel inappropriate answering the question because I, I don't want to, I don't want to be disrespectful and I don't want to leave anyone out. It's like, who's your favorite parent? You don't really want to necessarily answer that question out loud. Um, different times and different seasons in my life, it's different. Um, there's a number of gods that I've made 
bonds with that I feel very, very close to in that way. And there's others that I really look forward to. Um, starting out, I think the guy that I related to the most starting out and was most a part of my uh, becoming involved in Al true was Asa Thor. Um, Thor, again, I was a, I was a young guy and, and the idea of the strength and the power and, you know, fighting giants and, you know, all of those things about Thor were very appealing to me, still are. Um, and that was, that meant a lot. The idea of him protecting the gods and protecting the folk, um, at that time, I, you know, that was, well, I guess not at that time, but a, a number of years later, you know, I, I spent a lot of time being a bouncer and being involved in security work and things like that. And I think that, you know, that was very relatable to me. Um, as, uh, as time went on and I got more and more involved in the AFA, more involved in leadership of the AFA, because I've been Time sneaks up on you. I've, I'm coming up on seven years now that I've been the Els Harry Gothi, but long before that, I was, you know, I was a, I was a Gothi. Before that, I was a, a folk builder. I was the folk builder coordinator for a time, and I was really fortunate for a long time to have a lot of interactions with Steve McNallan early on, and with with others that were leading the AFA at that time. And during that time, I. I came a lot closer to, to the all father Odin and very, very strongly connected to, uh, to Odin. And that's been amazing to me. Um, what's helped a lot to facilitate really strong connection between me and, uh, and Balder and Thor and Njorder, uh has been our, are establishing these Hoffs. One of my great honors as the Els Harrier Gothi is that I've been involved in making these Hoffs happen and that I've been able to officiate the dedication of these Hoffs. And dedicating a, a temple to one of our gods is a, is a real big deal to me and uh, I think has helped us build a much you know, as a as a whole, as our AFA family has helped us build a closer relationship with these gods, but certainly has helped me personally. Um, and lately, I've been very much, <clears throat> I don't know, building a closer relationship with Tyr, because I'm going to be moving to Sigurheim with all the work on Sigurheim. That's where Tearshoff will end up being. And so I've spent a lot of time in prayer and meditation and uh, devotion work to Tyr to have his his help in guiding that. Um, our next question, Matt, can you explain a little bit about the story behind the thumbnail for tonight's episode? Yeah, ideally, I want to use a picture of me and the person that I'm doing the episode with, but the only pictures of me and Sarah together, and we should fix that at uh, at Elsie Fest. But the only pictures I have of just of me and Sarah are with a big group of people. And they didn't work well for just me and Sarah. You'll notice the other ones that I have of me and my guest. It's like just us. So if I don't have the perfect one I want, then I go ridiculous. And I try to find either something about the time period or a wrestling tag team or something ridiculous. Because the height of Elsie's work was in the 1980s. I hearken back to... Uh, Hunter, which was an awesome show for any of you guys that don't know. You kids may never not have heard of Hunter, but it was a real good show. And the thing was, Hunter, who was me in the picture, he had this uh, female partner. And it was strange. I didn't understand it as a kid. I was trying to figure it out. But she had these painted on eyebrows. Anyways, I digress. So it was a it was a guy and his female partner. And they're, you know, it was a cop show. And it was cool from the 1980s, which was the appropriate period. So that's 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 as deep as that goes. Um, King of Cheese, Matt, Sarah, it's great to see you both. How are we doing tonight? I appreciate you asking, Tony. Uh, Sarah, how are you doing tonight? Been a pretty good night so far. I I was a little nervous. I'm getting better, and um, it's been a good day. And I'm thankful to be here. 
Tony, I'm doing fantastic. I tell you every week, but I look forward to these. They're awesome. And I'm really excited because tomorrow I am flying out to Elsie Fest and I'm looking forward to that. Um, but I should have read this one earlier, but it popped on and I didn't get it in time. But with a $5 donation, thank you very much, Michael. We appreciate it. Hail Matt, hail Sarah, hail the gods, and hail the folk. Uh, thank you both for your valuable work on behalf of the folk and faith. Well, we appreciate that, Michael. Thank you very much, and thank you for your donation. Uh, and thanks to everybody who's in the chat. Um, this is a so much of this is uh, audience driven as far as the questions and answers. And we have been really fortunate to have great people on here every week. And we've got a full chat room tonight. So I'm excited about that. You guys, you guys bring the content with your great questions. Uh, Tyler asks, Sarah, can you speak about where the idea for Elsie Fest came from and why it's so important to celebrate her? Yes. Um, uh, two years ago, the AFA was structured differently. It had regions instead of districts, and the Midwest was looking for uh, a regional event to hold. And my husband James suggested Elsie because he has a he has a connection where he's he's always wanted to head a prison ministry because of the way his life ha has gone and and how he's risen above what he's come out of. And Elsie has been a very important person in his life. So he suggested Elsie. So it was a remembrance for Elsie Fest. And then in the middle of the planning, Matt decided to make districts instead of regions. So suddenly all these people who were in regions with James, because I wasn't in leadership at that time, were now in a faraway district. So they weren't as keen on helping because they were doing their own stuff in their own place, which is totally understandable. So um, we found a camp here in Wisconsin and this camp is amazing and they know exactly who we are. They know what we're about and they still like us. So <laughs> it is, um, it was a very good find. They're good people. And Elsie is just a wonderful person beyond her her revival of Osichru. This work, sh prisoners are just so often forgotten. That they're, they're still our folk. Not all of them are wonderful people. Not all of them are going to be awesome when they come out. And but they're still our folk, and they still deserve a chance to learn more about our folk and be a part because essentially they're still a part of our folk soul. So it makes sense to educate them, to help them grow, to give them the tools, to put that in their hands so that they can go forward <clears throat> with that knowledge and make their own decisions with that. You will get, in our leadership, there are several amazing men who you would never guess came out of the prison system. Osichu has changed their life, made them better people, and given them something to hold on to instead of reoffending. And that is the lesson that I believe Elsie started. And um, we mirror that now in the our prison ministry that we started. We we understand that they're not gonna all come out and join the AFA and they're not gonna come out and not go back in, but we are giving them the basics to help them have something to hold on to, have something to grow, have knowledge to learn. And, and that's why it's important that we remember her. <laughs> so my old timers over on the side, Hunter's partner name was Dee Dee McCall. I appreciate you guys remembering that. I remember I was, again, I was a little, I was young for that particular program at the time, but I watched it when it was on. And I also watched the, you know, pretty close, to it reruns on cable as well. I remember I was sick one day from school and there was a, I was sick actually two days, but there was a three part Hunter episode. So I, I faked being sick on the third day. Kids don't do this, but I faked being sick so I could stay home to see the thrilling conclusion of uh, a three part episode. 
But I appreciate you guys on the side. Um, us old timers got to stick together. That said, with a, a note on some of the prison stuff, um, yeah, some of, so I've been doing this for, Alcatru that is, prison ministry I've only been doing very, very recently, but uh, Alcatru I've been doing for a long time and I've seen a whole lot of ex-cons that are tragic and very, very disappointing. But you know what? I've seen a couple. I've seen a few. I've seen some that have been absolutely amazing. And that's worth it. You know, I go in there and every first of all, I'll say this. I had no idea what to expect when I went in. Um, no idea whatsoever. But I wanted to go in. It's I am a priest of the gods. And if we have our folk that want to connect with our gods, it's quite literally my job to try to facilitate that. Everybody, when I've been in there, has been extremely, extremely gracious and thankful for me coming in and have been fantastic. Will a lot of them end up being turds if and when they get out? Maybe. I don't know. I hope not. But if just some of them turn out being fantastic and turning their life around and doing something great with it, absolutely worth it. Um it's important that we go where our folk are. And unfortunately, a lot of our a lot of our folk have situations in their life and make choices that find them uh, in prison. And if they want to turn their lives around and embrace our gods and do that, then it's really important for me that uh, that I and that our Gothar can do something to facilitate that and make that a little bit better. And like I say, it's not gonna it's not gonna fix everybody. It's one of the reasons that we don't allow you know we don't allow someone who's incarcerated to join the AFA while they are incarcerated. But we hope that they will when they get out. If you know if they choose to to maintain that when they get out and uh, when they get out in the real world and they have all those choices before them, that's when we see you know if this is real to them or not. But hopefully it is hopefully it will be and i know it has been for some of our some of our very best people and some of my very best friends um you don't always choose where you you target where you want to go we have excuse me we have to go where our folk are and we've seen largely because of the work that uh, elsie put in that prison is a place where a lot of our people can find their path home to our gods and uh, it, I know it's turned the lives around of, of many, many people over the over the decades. And that's something that Elsie uh, put in motion. And she mentioned, and I think it's important to mention this, uh, Sarah's husband, James, is the head of our prison ministries. He has done more in his short time leading that program than we've ever had before in the AFA as far as making this work. And it's it's a anything dealing with prisons is a very slow progress but james has stuck with it he's done awesome and we've had three or four people before him say they were gonna do it and they just couldn't couldn't quite get their footing because it's difficult working with those systems working with different prisons arranging different things uh james has really made a big impact and i'm personally very grateful for that he's doing a really good job um Next question, do all Hoffs have dedicated spaces to Elsie or just the beautiful Baldershoff? No, just Baldershoff right now. Each of our Hoffs have a different hero that they celebrate. Uh, at Odenshoff, we have Meister Guido von List. At Thorshoff, we have Alexander Red Mills. At Baldershoff, we have Elsie. And then at Njordshoff, we have Raoul the Strong. Um, Shay says, fish boil, please tell me more. Recipe, what kind of rolls or sides do y'all serve with it? Yum. Sarah, you may have something to add on this. Can you tell uh, Shay about the wonderfulness and deliciousness that is the fish boil? Uh, fish boil is, um, it is a Wisconsin staple. Um, the more dramatic places up in Door County actually hold it outside. They have a big pot over an open fire. So you're putting small potatoes in it, carrots, 
little onions and white fish. Uh, James uses either cod or haddock in his, and then you're putting it in the salt water. So all the fat and all the salt rises to the top of the water. And the final act in these dramatic ones is something called a boil over where all that is just, you're adding stuff to it and it just all boils over into the fire. So then you dump all that out and you serve it in a bowl covered with melted butter. And typically you get a side of coleslaw and rye bread with butter on it. And it is delicious. It is absolutely delicious. And probably it's good for you up until you add that butter. Depends. If it's cold outside, it's all good for you. It depends on what you need the extra fat for, but it's delicious. It really is good stuff. I look forward to it. It's not the most complicated thing in the world, but it's amazing and it's it's awesome. And I'm you guys have heard me for the past couple of weeks, a couple, three, four weeks talking about that on here because I really am looking forward to that. Um so we got a question here about some LC biography stuff we've all right no i think we've covered all of that question um next question is sarah oh this is from sarah so i don't know if it's from you or from somebody else uh matt since elsie was added to the remembrance days during your time as i'll hear your gothi can you explain what about her life indeed stood out to you that you wanted to make sure she was honored um yeah so when I became Alls Harrier Gothi, our days of remembrance were kind of forgotten. Um, it was something that folks did during the free assembly days, and it wasn't really a prominent thing. I think people that read some of the older literature and some different stuff about Alsatru kind of practiced it on their own at home or whatever on some of those days of remembrance. Almost all of them were, were from martyrs that you find in the Heimskringla saga about the different kings of Norway and the conversion process and those of our folk who stood up against that. Almost all of them. I think the exceptions were um, Radbod in August and uh, in September Arminius or, or Hermann. And I wanted to make sure that we honored our modern heroes that did so much to build what we all have today, as opposed to just confine it to, to an ancient period of time. That was really important to me. And in examining modern people that had been so influential in making this happen, you know, Elsie was certainly one of those. She's one that so many people talked about a lot of people that I knew had stories about and through the work that she did and the path that she laid out, it brought a lot of our people home. Um, and again, what was, there's a whole generation of these people that did this, many of them without knowledge of the other, or at least they started it that way. Um, Elsie, and Sveinbjorn Vantensen in Iceland and Steve McNallan all started doing this complete at the, within a couple of years of one another, completely not knowing of the existence of the others. Um, so that was that was our gods working in a very, very interesting way. That was that spirit of Odin working amongst our folk soul in a, in a really profound way. And I've said this before, but the, and I think we all can learn from this. The biggest distance is between the couch and the front door. The biggest difference is between doing nothing to doing something. And after that, you pick up momentum. After that, you build upon what you've done. But the biggest thing is going from stasis and theory and it all in your head and something you think and something you ponder and you plan and then actually going out and doing Ausatru. 
And it's so much easier now because we have such a support system. We have all these other people out here facilitating it and, and helping us do this. But Elsie did this at a time where it didn't exist. She read about this Australian guy on the other side of the world that decades earlier was doing something. And from that, she built in, you know, in Canada and in, in, in North America, a network of people. She built what she had from nothing and contributed. I mean, she was directly involved with so many of our early practitioners of our faith and in bringing so many people to Alcatru. And she absolutely deserves to be honored and celebrated for the rest of time amongst our folk. Um, and it was unfortunate that she wasn't at the time. And I wanted to do what I could to, to remedy that. Our next question from Brandy. Hail Sarah, could you tell us about the gifts you bring to Elsie's altar at Baldershoff? Um, since I've been going up to Baldershoff and the altar has been there, uh, it is part of my ritual. The very first thing I do when I get in the building, I don't say hi to a lot of people. I go right to Elsie's altar and I have a moment with her and I usually bring something, a gift for her, um, whether it be an acorn or some other piece of nature or flowers, or I made her a glass jar full of acorns that has a, a hammer in it that um, another folk builder had made. There's a gift um, on her altar of something that Ron McVan had made and it, it's just important for me to have that first moment with her. Um, I consider her, I guess, something that you would call like a sister of the past because I, I, I'm not related to her. Um, I never got a chance to m meet her, um, even though she was alive during my time. And I am blown away by the amount of inmates that I have met with, that have come out of the prison system, who she touched their life just through the correspondence that she was doing with them. And, and that means a lot to a lot of people. And she was a very special lady. So I like to have that, that moment with her and I, I always bring her something. I think that's really special, and I'm glad that you do that. Um, I know that a number of our people individually have little rituals like that they do when they come to one of our hoffs. It's always, wish I could say that was our first thing, but I drive quite a di <laughs> You drive a longer distance to get to Baldur's Hoff, absolutely. But it's about a two and a half hour drive to Odin's Hoff, so my first stop is usually the bathroom. After that stop's <laughs> taken care of, though I usually light some incense at uh, the All Father's altar and I go and I, and I say something at uh, Meister von Liss altar as well. And I always try to do that when I go to the different Hoffs because it's really important. Um, that stuff's not just there to be pretty, uh, it's there to receive worship, to receive gifts. And as, if you will, as a portal to those people beyond the veil, both to our gods and to our heroes that we're honoring in a way to way to celebrate them. And so I think it's really cool that you do that. Um, and now we have a question from Katie, and this one's about Alexander Rudd Mills. Sarah, did Alexander Rudd Mills write any other stuff? If so, can you expound? He, he actually wrote a lot of stuff. Um, off the top of my head, I cannot think of anything, Matt. I'm sorry. Uh-oh, uh-oh. So he did, he wrote, he wrote a lot of things. He wrote a lot of poetry. Um, we're really, so now I got to think of what exact, okay. Hail Odin is the book that we have. We have uh, at his altar at Thorshof, we actually have an original edition of one of his works and it uh, came with an inscription to a gentleman in England that he'd sent it to. And along with a letter that he wrote on his 
stationary. He was a he was a barrister. He was a lawyer in Australia. And so from his law office, he, he typed up this this letter to someone in England and signed it. So we have this original book there. And it's really cool to have something like that that he touched, that he wrote in. Um, but it's a book of his poetry. Um, he wrote The Call of Our Ancient Nordic Religion. Yes, that one. He wrote a lot of different stuff. And again, a lot of it was poetry. So, <clears throat> yeah, and we're going to have actually, think. So now I'm, now I'm all stumped on, uh, I feel a little bit bad about this, on uh, when his... Oh, when is his day of remembrance? And we also got a uh, episode coming up on him shortly that will tell you a little bit more about him and some of the stuff that he wrote. Um, a lot of it is hard to get. A lot of it's stuff you can find uh, PDFs for online. And so... It would be cool if I was a little bit stealthier here, but I'm not. So I was trying to go ahead and throw this up on uh, quick Wikipedia and go to partial bibliography. All right. He wrote, usually I'm able to do that behind the scenes and look a lot cooler on here. But yes, I'm looking on Wikipedia right now. Call of Ancient Nord Nordic Religion, Reflections on the Theological Content of the Sagas, published in 1957. Law of the Ordinary Man, uh, published in Melbourne, self-published in 1947. Um, the Odinist Religion, Overcoming Judeo-Christianity, from 1939. A Ritual Book of the Moots of the Anglican Body. He founded the Anglican Church of Odin, was what he called his uh, organization that he had in Australia, and he published that in 37. He had the first guidebook to the Anglican Church of Odin, published in Sydney in 1936. Hail Odin, which is what we have. Uh, it was published in 34. And then, uh, and fear shall be in the way. Uh, that was published in London in 1933. So th that's a partial list of the different works that he wrote. He did self-publish a lot with some of his poetry and his other things. So I don't think that's an exhaustive uh, list. Interesting fact um, that I do know, uh, there is a man named Ostrid who has since passed away. When Mills died, he was working on a book with him that Ostrid has the manuscript to. Ostrid is the, was the head of the Odenic Rite in Australia, and it is, was a completely separate thing than the regular Odenic Rite that we know. And he had an impressive library of first editions of lots of things to do with Odinism and Ossature, a lot of our, our pioneers that no one knows what happened to. So this is one of the, I mentioned this or something like this on most of our episodes about our heroes, and I'm going to continue to do so. You never think something's history until the moment's passed and you look back on something in the past. If we don't preserve these things, then they get lost. And sometimes they're lost beyond recovery. Um, a lot of those things that he had, I hope and I pray that we will eventually uncover or be able to get access to. That's why it's really important. It was very important to me and has been that we put up, you know, an archive of all of the material I could find, all of the old rune stones that I was able to get a hold of and put those up on the library section of our website. Um, it's our job in the here and now to preserve things for posterity, because if we don't, they won't be there when folks need them. Um, and our recent history gets lost like that so much because, you know, this is just, you know, just some stuff we're doing right now. And you don't think of it with the weight of history upon it, but it is, and it's our history. And it may seem run of the mill to us today because we're doing this every day and we're, we're slogging through making stuff happen. But 
this is stuff that, you know, Aubrey, when she's older, is going to want to read about what we did during these times. And, you know, our grandkids are going to want to know what we were doing and why we were doing it. And so it's really important to keep those things documented. That's why our Hoff historians are so very important. And people working on our website team are so important. These things matter. What we do matters. And it will matter to folks in the future that will wish they had it. Um, uh, it looks like Apprentice Folk Builder Allie will be talking about Rudd Mills on July 5th. And his Remembrance Day is July 9th. See, there you go. It's coming up. <clears throat> All right. So the next question is from Shay. Are there any friends of Elsie still around? Did she have kids? And if so, are they practicing Elsa Troop? Sarah. She never had any kids. Her and Alex never did. Um, and it's not something she talked about. So I don't know much about that, but I know that they did not have kids. Um, Elsie obviously had a lot of friends with the prisoners that she wrote to. Um, the other also true people, Odinist people at the time. It is interesting that, you know, we rely on the internet so much for communication with people around the world and they were doing phone calls and letters back then. So her relationship like with the McNallans and with, with other people at that time was based on letters, was based on phone calls, not meeting in person or, or doing FaceTiming on the computer. One of the pictures that was put up was at an event that uh, Steve and Sheila were at and uh, with her tossing the caber. Some people, you know, I know people who have met her and spent, you know, a little bit of time communicating with her that way. Um, there are people who actively corresponded with her that are still around. I'm not sure who we have involved in the Astro Folk Assembly that personally corresponded with her. And I think, you know, that would be would be awesome to find out if we had those folks and if we do I'd, I'd love for them to step up it's absolutely you know something uh i don't know if you mentioned this uh what year did lc pass sarah 2005. so i mean there's there's plenty of people around that that's lives have overlapped hers so we'd love to love to hear from those folks um Sorry, guys, I'm refreshing my screen here because I think I was missing some of the some of the chat. Bear with me one second. Used to be this is what my my monthly live chats were like all the time was constantly me reading, reading over chat stuff and tons of dead air. So this is a rarity. All right. Um, This is an interesting question. I think this goes into something uh, something we were mentioning earlier. So the next question is from Anonymous. How can Odinism slash Ausatru not be dogmatic, but also unify into one front? Would it not be difficult to unify if there are many different interpretations? Absolutely. So this is at this is why historical perspective is so important. When Elsie was writing that there wasn't organization. There were some groups that would call themselves organized, but they were tens and a handful of people, and they were separated by snail mail across the surface of the earth. And honestly, they were just figuring it out. And they were in a point where they needed maximum freedom of exploring stuff and figuring stuff out because they were in the very infancy of modern Ausatru and they were starting from scratch. And, uh, and I get that. Um, obviously, it's extremely important to the AFA that we bring that stuff together, that we bring Ausatru under, under one roof, under one banner, and that we do establish some dogma. Everything doesn't need to be dogmatic, but certainly we need dogma. Dogma is one of those words that (sighs) 
it's developed a bad reputation, but it's not a bad word. Um, it basically means consistent teaching or, you know, a, a standardized what is our stance on X. And we need that or else or else we're nothing or else the word house true doesn't mean anything unless we have some sort of some dogma to what it means. And even even in Elsie's day, there was plenty of that or there was some of that. Certainly the, the, the noble virtues are a form of dogma, an early form of dogma. Um, and you see that Elsie, even in writing that, she said that, yeah, one day stuff would be united. The way that you unite stuff is by that dogma and by hierarchy that at the time, Elsie probably wasn't a huge fan of. But what hierarchy and what dogma was there for her to be a fan of at her time that she was around and when she was most active? Um, when she was writing a lot of that, the groups unified in practicing any form of ouster true were very small. It was a lot of a lot of LARPy dress up Viking stuff, a lot of Brosa true stuff. There was, you know, what she was doing was really important to her. But as she admitted, she wasn't doing a lot of ritual. She wasn't doing a lot of the spiritual practice. That is what breeds dogma and advancement of our faith. So, you know, that's one of the ways that we've really advanced since Elsie's time. And it's something I hope that she'd be proud of. I think she'd absolutely be on board with some of it. Some of it, maybe not. But, uh, but yeah, I, I don't feel confined to practice Alsa True in the way that Elsie practiced it 30 years ago. Um, and, and I don't think that she would want us to have stagnated at that point. I would hope that none of those that have preceded us would want us to stop developing. So, you know, that, but your point is valid. There's there. And so I'll say this now, there's still a big contingent of people out there that don't like hierarchy and don't like dogma and don't want anybody else to tell them what to do. And those people don't move forward. Those people don't make progress. We owe it to those who came before us to build this into something, to leave a structure for our children to build upon and to advance this to something worthy of our gods and our folk. And in order to do that, you need hierarchy and you need dogma. But first, you need to build, restructure that spiritual connection between our folk and our gods. And Elsie wanted to encourage folks to do that, but she herself didn't know how to build that reconnection point. And that's something that the AFA has been able to do. Mm -hmm. um, but all these steps needed to be in place at the right time. So many, and this is part of our, our rune, Rytho, that's the rune of our priesthood. And that was the original um, logo of the Astro Free Assembly. All the right actions at the right time. At that point, when our folk were just awakening to our faith, it wasn't the time for that yet. The seed needed to germinate before it became the time for us to pull all of those cords together, pull all of these founders together and move out to true together in a unified way. And uh, that time has come and, and we've been very involved in that. Um, Trent has a question, a question for both Sarah and the Altair Gothi. No, never mind. That's an ancient question. I got to refresh my stuff. <laughs> I apologize. I apologize. Um, so, uh, huh. All right. I've got to find a lot of stuff. I apologize. <laughs> but in the meantime, how can we honor Elsie in our daily practices? Sarah, what are your thoughts on that? I would say the, the the greatest way is learning about her, raising a horn to her, saying her name out loud, um, sharing with others what you find out about her and her stories. Those are for obviously not just Elsie, but any of our ancestors that have passed. That is the greatest way to honor them, to keep their memory alive, to keep them here with us. All right. And yeah, honestly, I, yes, 
to do that, I feel like it's a way to honor the folk mother for myself to participate in the prison ministry that we do. Um, I think that's a way for our Gothar to, to honor Elsie is to keep that mission and that priority there. Um, but yeah, remembering her, telling her stories, learning about her, learning about her life, learning and reading things that she wrote that keeps, that keeps her, uh, her name and her influence alive here in Midgard. Um, uh, Sarah, can you please expand on how Elsie's prison time changed slash created her prison outreach program? So t first, before you do that, can you tell that story? Because I think a lot of the folk out there listening may not be familiar. Okay. Um, yeah, when I talk with Okay, um, let's see. In in about 1993, she was caught. Basically, what had happened is while she was living in Florida, she got to knew, know this um, owner of a used car lot, and he hired her to drive a car several times, different cars, from Florida to Texas. And she didn't think nothing of it and she needed the money. So she just did it. But what he was thinking is the police wouldn't pull over an old lady driving a car. The car was stuffed with drugs and she did get pulled over and arrested for that. And she went on trial for that. Um, she blames her naivety of not knowing that there were drugs in the vehicle. And like I said, the car dealer knew that nobody would suspect this old lady driving the car and she she could you really use the money um it was during that time that stephen mcnallen and vanguard murray started the free elsie campaign to help her with her legal defense she was convicted of the crime and spent i believe just a year in prison and of that time she said she was actually thankful for that time because it got her to understand what she had been the part of the because she would go into the prisons to have these study groups she felt she understood prisoners better from seeing the other side of the stuff that she hadn't seen before plus it gave her an opportunity to talk to many women that she would have never in her whole lifetime talked to and it was very much an eye-opening learning experience for her. So, yeah, I think it's important to point out that her uh, prison outreach predates her incarceration. Mm -hmm. uh, so it wasn't something that she just started. It was something that added a lot of dimension to what she was doing. Um, it's mm -hmm. really unfortunate, but that's the thing. Um, our folk are broken. We have a soul sickness in our folk soul and our people are are beat down. And a lot of folks involved in this, especially in the early days, turned out to uh, to be damaged folks and to have not the best intentions. And uh, one of those situations was setting up, an old, you know, I guess not setting up, but using the naivety of an old lady to uh, further their own their own uh extra legal ends and uh at the cost of you know at the cost of this this lady's reputation and freedom and that's really unfortunate um the austro folk assembly along with many others participated in trying to fundraise for her legal defense also to try to fundraise for her to get the ability to get extradited or back into, I think she was deported to Canada. Is that the case? She was. So yeah, she was deported to Canada and to try to get her back here in the United States where she'd lived, where she had resources. And that was a big thing. And I sent over Nick a uh, picture for Nick and I'm sure he'll pop that up when he's able, but it's of uh, it's an old picture of Steve in a, you know, like a free Elsie shirt. And so that was something that, that people across Alcatru did at the time. And the McNallans helped while she was incarcerated. They helped publish some of her works so that could keep going even while she was inside. <clears throat> oh, 
Okay. Uh, so what is a daily practice that you have to honor the gods and ancestors? Sarah, do you want to enlighten folks on your daily practice? Yes. Every morning, um, I talk about this a lot in, in the ladies podcasts that we do. Um, every morning when I get up, the very first thing I do is I have an altar right by my bed. That is my personal altar. And I hail the day and I thank the gods and I start talking to my ancestors. I put my hand upon my heart and I feel my heart beat. And I relax and remember that that is the same heartbeat that goes down my line and connects me to every one of my female ancestors. And I ask them for guidance for the day. And then I do a ruin pull. I galder the ruin. I think about its meaning to me. I thank the ancestors for being with me. And then I go about my day. And that is every single day, regardless of if I'm running late. Because if I ever miss it, the day is not the same. And that is what I do. There you go. There's a lot of different things that people do. And some of them are very small things or very small actions or actions that don't take a lot of time or don't seem big, but they can make a big impact on someone's day. Um, you know, I, some of these things sound really small, but I think, and I'll reiterate this, I've said this a lot, our gods and our ancestors are bigger than this, our gods certainly, but we take our cues from how we interact with people that we know on this side of the veil. If someone reaches out to you and tells you good morning or asks you how your day was, it's really simple, but just getting that text from somebody means a lot. You know, um, getting a phone call from somebody, just checking in on you, wanted to say hi, means a lot. Calling your parents, calling your grandparents, and just checking in and saying hi means a tremendous amount. I have to believe that that means a lot across the veil, especially when these people have been forgotten by a lot of the people they knew in life. Reaching out just to say hi and to have a kind word to one of your ancestors, I think that means a lot. Um, I think reaching out, you know, making a small offering and, and saying something to one of our gods that act in and of itself is meaningful and it keeps that uh, that cycle of, of gifting alive, even if it's something really small and really simple. Those things are very important. Some people like to do that in the morning when they first wake up. Some people like to do that at night before they go to bed. Some people like to do both. Um, but I encourage everybody to speak to their ancestors, speak to their gods, do it often. Um, Sarah, can you expand on the prison outreach program you are involved in with the WAU? Um, yes. Uh, I, I will note that my work with the WAU is completely separate from the AFA, where the AFA is my spiritualness, my, my religion. Um, the WAU is my sisterhood and part of my political belief system that is completely separate from the AFA. Um, one of the things that WAU has been around for oh, 35 odd years now, and I have been a member for 20 years. One of the biggest things we do is we have a prison outreach, not really close to what Elsie's was because we don't actually go into prisons, but we correspond. We have a newsletter called Behind the Wire that has articles written by different prisoners and from our sisters on various subjects just to, so they have something to read inside. Um, and this is actually how I first heard about Elsie because a lot of these men that we would write to would, would talk about Elsie and the letters that they received from her. And um, I, I guess I, 
at that point in my life, I didn't realize how important she would be to me later in life. So I heard about her while she was alive and I could have met her. And it's just something that I think of now and then. But um, again, as I had mentioned earlier, these, these men and women behind bars are often forgotten, but they are still our folk. And, and we do want the best for them as we do for all our folk. Next question, uh, <clears throat> Matt, you say there are some convicts you will not, who will not work out when they get out. Are there convicts who you will not work with or bring into the AFA upon release? Well, yeah. Um, so here's the thing. It, it becomes really challenging because we want all of our people to have a pathway to something better and to a connection with their gods. But there's obviously things that transgress that. If you are convicted for sexually molesting a child, you are broken to a degree that we cannot and will not let you be involved in the Austria Folk Assembly. Uh, it's a danger to our children. It's a danger to our families. And once you've crossed that particular bridge, there's there's not anything we can really do for you. Um, there are some crimes, and it all depends, that are absolutely so heinous that, no, once you've done that, we really don't want to be have anything to do with you. Um, most of those situations that would fall in that category are segregated in the prisons that we would go to. And we don't extend our prison outreach to those yards for the sex offenders. That's not something we want to be involved in in any way. Um, so most of that happens there. As far as when they come out, it depends. Um, if the nature of their crime is something that we, that if they continue with a level of criminality, that's something that wouldn't warrant them being members of the AFA in the first place, then certainly we don't want them until those things are fixed. Um, we don't want anyone who's likely to be dangerous to our families or to our folk. We don't want to introduce that around our, around our children. But some of the, and again, a lot of people end up being dirt bags. They're in prison for a good reason, lots. But there's some really amazing people and some of my best friends that have had to go through there because of mistakes that they've made, but have turned it into something amazing and wanted to really, you know, <clears throat> one of the things is you lose time and you lose so many things. Uh, this is as I understand it. Again, I've never been in that situation, thankfully. But a lot of people come out wanting to make everything better and wanting to make up for lost time by doing and by building for our folk and our gods. And that's a really good thing. That's a really beautiful thing. And I wouldn't want to hold that back. But yeah, there are plenty of convicts who get out that I wouldn't want to work with and I wouldn't want to bring in the AFA. But those are individual situations. And we don't typically do that by blanket rule other than if you have a consistency of violence towards women, violence towards children, violence towards elderly people, violence towards um, people that you can victimize. No, we don't want those people, obviously. But yeah, that uh, other beyond those bounds, it is kind of a case by case basis that uh, our leadership talks about. So James asks, I think he knows the answer to these questions. Are Elsie's writings available and will they be preserved? Sarah, um, let's say you. They are working on, James is working on preserving them. He is compiling them in a book and uploading them on a, on a website. So they're available for all people. Um, he is missing a couple of the issues of the Odinists that he has been hunting down and yep, that sometime soon, hopefully that'll be available for more people to be able to read her writing. Um, you have to understand that she was typing this stuff out on a typewriter and then using a very, very old printing press to make copies of them all completely on her own without any help. So a lot of these, um, 
they're they're off center. They're very hard to scan because they go in different directions, and it, it's been very interesting reading through all this history as we do this. But it is a tedious, long project, but it is well worth it. And in the end, just to have everything together in one place available to everyone will be wonderful. That's something, James, that I want to talk to you more about this weekend. I think it's an amazing thing that you're doing, and uh, that's awesome. And it follows right on with what I was saying earlier. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of conversation over in the side chat about dogma stuff. We have a question that I'm going to get into that a little more on, but please know I do see the side, the side chat, and I am going to address that here in a bit. Um, next question from the King of Cheese. So, Sarah, uh, you've told us about how you came to the AFA. How did you get into paganism? You said you worshipped uh, Brigid uh, before. Where did it all start? I was a Roman Catholic for 28 years. And um, ever since I was a child, I, I've been kind of for lack of a better word, sensitive to things with nature and to other things kind of on a supernatural level, as kooky as that sounds, um, without every understanding of what I was doing. And if anyone has ever been Roman Catholic, you know that it is a dull, dead religion that um, does not bring forth any joy. From that, I was a United Pentecostal for six years, which is a very lively religion. Um, a lot of hallelujahs and dancing and, and stuff, but it, it all seems just kind of going through motions in an act. And, and the God that they talked about, I couldn't connect with. It, it, I didn't feel like home. So as I, I, I am, I'm adopted through my father's side. So when I started looking into things with my biological father, I um, did a DNA test and he is almost fully Irish. And so as I was discovering more about Ireland and certain people came into my life that that were actually from Ireland, I learned more about the magical side of Ireland. So I dealt kind of dwelled into the Druid stuff, the the nature, the, the a little bit of Wiccan and some ancestral witchcraft type stuff, which felt more to me, but yet it wasn't complete. Um, so my connection to Bridget was was very intense and deep but not all encompassing and finding more about osichru well actually odinism and wotanism at that time because going from from the the celtic irish stuff into um speaking with david lane and learning about wotanism and then ron mcvan with wotanism finding more about um, Odinism, and then eventually with James coming to Osichru. And this is this is home. Osichru is home. I, I know it's the blood memory. I know that that's the call, but home is just the all encompassing of what to call it. And, and that's where I am at this point. I'm just, I'm home. I love hearing you say that. Um, that's what a lot of our people, myself included, feel. And what we say, it's it's not just a marketing thing. Our kind of our slogan is it's about roots. It's about connections. It's about coming home. This is our home and this is our family. And uh, we really mean that. And I know it, you know, it sounds whatever to folks that aren't a part of it. But when you join the AFA, you feel like that or hopefully you do if we're doing it right. Um, so <clears throat> Nick's got that picture. If he can throw that picture up, this was at a time where a lot of folks were 
they were selling commemorative coins and t-shirts and all kind of stuff to try to raise money to help Elsie. I don't know if you can make that any bigger, James, but it's kind of little. Or not James, I'm sorry, Nick, but it's kind of little. Um, anyways, that's a Steve in the 90s with the, with the shirt on there. Um, I think it says, I can't even read it because it's tiny, so I got to pull it back up on my phone. Um, yeah, it says Alsa True. Uh, it's the Odinist logo of her newsletter that she had. It says LC Christensen Defense Fund. Uh, we stand up for our own. And that's that's a way that so many people felt at the time. There we go. Now he's got it enlarged. Uh, we appreciate our producer, uh, Nick Rice. He does an awesome job for us every week. Uh, this week is no exception. Um, so King of Cheese says, uh, Matt, how have your family uh, been doing? I ask every week, but I forgot to ask about them. They're doing great. Um, you know, Mandy's Mandy's got some kind of cramp in her back right now, so she's not doing 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 that great. But no, we're all doing really, really well. Aubrey is in the face where she says no to everything, whether she means no or not. It's just no all the time and she'll growl it, but she'll still do what we do. And then if you tickle her, she'll start laughing and it breaks the grumpy face. So she's doing good. We're all doing awesome. Uh, three is challenging, but what's cool is it seems like you watch her learn something new every single day, a new word, a new, you know, knowing how to do something on her own, knowing how to the other. Okay. So something simple and stupid, like those little cuties, the little, the little oranges. She went, I, I watched in 24 hours, her go from not having any clue what to do to watching me do it and kind of break it open with her teeth and then smush it and whatever. Now she can open those like a pro and she's awesome. And I watched her figure that out in one day and it sounds ridiculous. Parents out there will probably understand what I'm saying, but it's really cool to watch them, you know, in real time, learn how to do stuff. That's really neat. Um, I'm checking because I think I may have to reload on something here in a second. I am going to click reload, but first I'm going to read this question. I'll be answering this while I do my refreshing because I can multitask like that. I understand else. Okay. This is from Michael. Um, same guy who gave us five bucks earlier. We appreciate that. Uh, I understand that Elsie was a Strasserite, a Naz Bowl in her younger days. Did she ever change from that? Myself, I am a national socialist and believe that the German Fuhrer Adolf Hitler was a great man. Um, Sarah, did Elsie's political position change as she advanced in years? I do not know. There is her writings were always focused on the Odinism aspect in later life. Um, I haven't read anything in interviews or the Odin her publication or any of the other things she's written on the political question. So I'm not sure. So that's a good question. And honestly, I wish that I knew more of nuanced Elsie things and I don't, I wish that I did. Um, Nick, if you could re-throw up those questions, cause I did just reload entropy. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and we've got we've got members of the AFA that uh, have a variety of different political views. Mm -hmm. There are certainly some of those political views on the far left that aren't in congruence with being in the House True Folk Assembly, but there's a variety of views on the middle to right end of that spectrum in the House True Folk Assembly. Um, one thing also to consider is here 90 years removed from that time we all have and, and just like you said your version of national socialism and of the Fuhrer are probably very different than a lot of our audiences and we can't agree on a lot of history because we view it through our modern lens 
But during the time in which it occurred, there was a lot of other things to consider. And I think we were in a, a phase at that time where a lot of the elites and the monarchies of the time had become completely flaccid and effete and overgrown and weren't meeting the needs of their folk in a lot of different ways. And I think there was a lot of reactions to that that were extreme. And I say that at no point would, would I support Strasserism or, uh, or Bolshevism. But a lot of people at that time were trying to figure out, hey, what's going to work here? Because what we have is broken. Um, and so people were, were flailing for something new and for something different. Um, one thing that is very important to the AFA is that leader principle that was so important at the time on the opposite end of where Elsie was at was the idea of individual leadership taking responsibility for um, their departments, the areas that they had control over and the buck stopping with them as opposed to bloated committees and and different uh, bureaucracies. And that was that's really important to the AFA. But honestly, times are really different. And you also have to consider that her relationship to German National Socialism is different because she was in an occupied country that wasn't you know, part of pre-war Germany. Um, that makes that outlook probably look very different than it did if she was in, you know, Berlin. Uh, her being in Denmark made her situation a little bit different. And I'm not sure how that developed as she grew up. I wish I knew a little bit more. Um, next question I have is, what about the bloat? What about the blood sacrifice? It's kind of an open question. Um, so there are people today who still participate in uh, live animal sacrifice. And I think that may sound scary to a lot of folks. And that's one of the reasons that it's very seldom talked about. One of the things that was really important to our ancestors in ancient sacrifice that way and in the modern uh, iteration of it is it's the ritual slaughtering of an animal and then feeding it to the folk. And in uh, our ancestors' time, that was the only time that a lot of the uh, lower classes were able to eat meat was during these festivals. Um, there is something absolutely sacred about the bloat process between laying hands on something that is living, putting your energy in that, slaughtering that animal and then having that energy pass beyond the veil. So many people today are so very far removed from any kind of animal husbandry lifestyle that it's silly and we don't just bring out animals to kill them. That's, that's at best LARPy and at worst kind of sadistic. So that's not something that most people practice all the time. But I have I have been involved in, in a number of different live animal bloats. Um, they've been profoundly spiritual if they're done in the right uh, circumstance with the right people at the right times. And, you know, all of those meat, all of that meat has been consumed by folk who are, are sharing that feast with our gods. So I think there's a, a misconception there, whereas um, in the Judaic faith, a lot of those sacrifices, the idea was the entire animal was was burnt as as an offering to their God, whereas in historic and in modern times, any kind of a live animal bloat in al has been about sharing a communal feast with the folk. And there's something really different about those two things to my mind. Um, so here, okay, here's the next question. And this is, is one that I wanted to uh, make sure we touched on. And it's kind of about that dogma um, point. Uh, I just, this is from Anonymous, I just wanted to clarify, I've heard in different Odinist slash Alcetru conversations that rules are for desert people or Abrahamic faiths, that Alcetru people are free. Sounds like you, you're saying there are rules for us too. Absolutely. Um, 
that whole attitude that there's no rules and no dogma and how's it true because we're free and everybody's free. I know that's something that was very common in uh, early Alcitru, and I think that a lot of the time was a reaction to faiths, specifically the Abrahamic faiths that are so very, very overladen with heavy amounts of do this, don't do that, do this, don't do that. You know, their God cares about all your, you know, bedroom practices and if you touch yourself and all kind of crazy stuff that's really intrusive. But it's an idea that's also very immature in our faith. We've we've moved past that. Yes, of course, there's rules. We're an actual religion. There are specific beliefs and there are specific things that are OK and that are not OK. Now, rather than a long list of legal thou shalt, thou shalt not. Much of our rules are presented in, in the form of principles because circumstances determine so much. There's absolutely dogma in Alcitru. There's absolutely rules in Alcitru. People who say they aren't are wrong. Um, and it's one of the things, Odinist slash Alcitru, there is only Alcitru. Everything else is just confusing. And when I say that, people that are involved in Alcitru for a long period of time use these terms because at one point there were very, very divergent isn't fair but there were divergent implications amongst these different things. Now we heard Sarah talk earlier about uh, Votanism versus Odinism versus Alcitru. And if we were having this conversation in the eighties or in the early nineties, perhaps that's really relevant. At this point, those things have either become stagnant or merged into the term that we use, Alcitru. And that's why in the Alcitru Folk Assembly, you see us honor some of these folks that weren't members of the Free Assembly and weren't members of the Folk Assembly, but were part of the folkish practice of our faith. Um, we're united and we're moving forward and we stick with the term Alcitru because it's ours and because we want to have a consistent meaning to what that means. And the more we try to differentiate to where everybody's got their different name for what we do, the more it has no meaning when we speak to people who are out on the outside that have never heard of it. So the more we consolidate into the use of the term Alcitru, the more we move forward in a unified way and the more we, we stand for something instead of the, you know, literally standing for nothing because there's so many different versions. So we've brought that all together the best we can, and we continue to try to do so. Um, so I'm going to check. This might, might be our last question, and it might not be, depending on how our, uh, our situation is here. So, Matt, where could I find a list of Alcitru slash Odinist male names? So I'm going to do one last reload here while I answer that question. Um, I don't think it works quite that simple because most of our names aren't determined by religiosity. They're determined by language. Um, there's a lot of places. I mean, you can just Google Germanic baby names um, and that will help you. Uh, but there's other ways that you can find. One of the biggest things is if you take names that you want to name your child and you uh, just look at the etymology and look at where they come from. And they don't have to be Norse to be relevant to our folk. The yeah, true folk assembly in our faith is pan pan Aryan. Um, there's a lot of names that are in European languages, what you want to look out and avoid is names that are that are Hebrew. And I say that I don't know who's listening to the program. If you're a Jewish fellow and you want to name your Jewish children something, then absolutely name them something Hebrew. But if you're also true and you're doing this, there's plenty of European names. So the other thing um, that was really important, uh, Gothi David James at the first time, uh, first time I went to an AFA event was a midsummer in. I think 2009. 
and go see David James was a, was an old man at the time. And he, uh, he gave a talk about, um, also true naming traditions. And one thing that he suggested, because so many of us have Hebrew names, um, my name, I've got a Hebrew name. Uh, so many of us have biblical names. If you want to name a child after someone, or if there's an important Hebrew name that you want to name your child, try to find an equivalent from one of our native tongues. You know, if you're an Englishman, try to find a, a, an Anglo-Saxon name that means something similar. Or if you're a German, try to find a German name that means something simple. Scandinavian or Irish or Welsh or whatever that may be of our of our different folk languages, that's a good choice for folks that want to name somebody after someone with because so many of our ancestors for a thousand years have a lot of them have biblically based names. Um, so yeah, that's something you could do. I was I was almost I almost had a German name. I was almost named Gerald, which means spear warrior. Uh, my father was a Gerald. My grandfather was a Gerald. I was almost named Gerald. And if I'd had a son, I would have named him Gerald. Um, but my, my dad never liked his name. He, so he always went by his middle name. So I think that's why they, they deviated and gave me a, a different and, uh, and Hebrew name. But that's some of the stuff that you, that you can do. Um, so I do have another question that's popped up, but only one more. Um, and this one's, this one's for you, Sarah. Can you give a brief rundown of what to expect at Elsie Fest by day? Yes. Um, on Friday, when you arrive, you'll get, um, signed into a cabin and then there'll be plenty of time to mingle and meet people and get to know the camp. Um, this year we have Witten Cliff Erickson who is coming with his family and he will do a ceremony welcoming the gods. Uh, there will be question and answer time with leadership that is there. So you can ask any questions that you like. Um, James managed to secure a musician that I know nothing about who will be playing music while we eat. Uh, Tyler Henling is coming from Montana. And I have wanted to meet him for a very long time. He is, seems like a very neat young man that has a lot of stuff going on. He uprooted his family and bought land in Montana and he is building this homestead from scratch. And he does a journal that he posts of it during the week. And it is some of the most interesting stuff I've ever read. And he seems like an interesting person. I've never met him. He is driving all the way from Montana and he will be giving a speech. Um, and then obviously the fish boil and late at night when it's dark, Matt will be doing an Odin's bloat, which is very, every year it has been intense and emotional and just incredible. There's a, a hill we walk up that's lit by candles. And in the darkness, you have the, the fire in front of you and it is just an intense thing. And I think you'll really enjoy that, Sterling. Um, the next day there'll be breakfast and folk builder James Alt will be doing a, another talk on Elsie. And then after that, Githia Katie Erickson will be doing the bloat to Elsie. Um, Every year that we have had Elsie Fest, it is always a female that does the bullet to Elsie. They are always emotional and she is honored, which I think hopefully she's happy with it, but I think she's honored very well with that. Um, the very first year it was Githia Anna Plord. And at the exact same time she was doing that, we had a bunch of AFA members up in Canada at her resting place did a bloat and and that was pretty powerful to have that connection um last year it was githia um brandy did the blow to elsie and like i said this year it's githia katie um after that there's a another speaker there's lunch and then the viking games which will have a hammer toss 
maybe the camber thing, if we can find a log. And there's a, a device called an atolatl. There is the hammer toss, the atolatl, uh, axe throwing, and two other ones that I can't remember right now. And during that time, I will have the kids with me and we will be doing a kid's bloat and a kid's sumble and a kid's craft because the Viking games tend to take a long time. And after that, lunch, or maybe lunch is before that. Another speaker, there is a men's and women's group going on. Dinner, uh, an auction that has some pretty amazing stuff that is going to be in it. Uh, what else? Sumble. And then on Sunday will basically be breakfast and a wayfarer's bloat and going home. So it should be a pretty awesome weekend. Oh, and this year during the LC bloat, James has talked to AFA members from around the world. So at the same time that we're doing the LC bloat, they're going to be doing their own rituals to LC. So it's going to be kind of cool to see how that all comes together. So it's going to be pretty exciting stuff. Excellent. So we have a few more questions generated, and I'm going to skip all the way ahead to the last question because I think it's important to address. No, Matt is not drinking a White Claw. Uh, I am drinking my second Firestone Mind Haze Double IPA. It is purple for some reason. Not sure why that is, but it's delicious. Um, yeah. Anyways, no, I am not drinking a White Claw. Only circumstance I would drink a White Claw is if somebody handed me one. Uh, free booze is the best booze. So I, anybody hands me a White Claw, I will drink it. But uh, no, that is, I would, I would not do that on this program, lest you were here and you handed me one. Um, that said, Okay, so I knew this one would come up. I hope you're prepared for this. Uh, Sarah, five favorite books and your favorite saga. Okay, I am prepared for this. We're going to start with Starship Tro Troopers, which is, is an awesome classic. The Federal Siege at Root. Ruby Ridge by the Weavers, which is an amazing firsthand account of, of what our government was capable of doing. This is a recent book that I have found. It's called The Healing Home, and it's by Christina Taylor. She is married to someone that I, I consider, um, Matt, would you say he's he's one of those pioneers of Austin True also? Robert? Uh, yeah, he was certainly... He... <laughs> And he is the most interesting man I have ever spoken to, hands down. He has definitely lived a life. <laughs> and he'll tell you about it <laughs> for hours. So yes. I, I, I enjoy talking with him. But his, his wife wrote this book. They have a, they have a son with autism, and it it's, uses spirituality to help moms of other special needs to um, find their selves in the middle of all this, what they do. So it's called The Healing Home by her. And one, two, three, four. Northern Mysteries and Magic by Freya Aswin. It is one of my favorite books for um, knowledge on ruins. And Project Ruin by Troy Weishart. Um, another really good one on all the different types of ruins and how to dwell deeper in them. And let's see, that's five. And my favorite saga would have to be the Volsung, just because it is, all our sagas are really cool, but this one, it's like a soap opera. There is so much stuff going on in this. It is, it is incredible. A man, man sleeps with his sister, has a baby with him. A mom kills her children because they're, they're weak. It just, it reminds me of a modern day soap opera and you learn a lot from it. Absolutely. Um, no, I think the Volks, Volsung saga is great. I think the Niblungenlied, which is the like, high medieval German 
telling of the same saga is really interesting and comparing the two is is awesome those are definitely some of my favorites as well um i didn't know that uh the taylors had had written a book about that um that's really interesting i want to learn more about that um shay asks any Sigurheim updates will there be drinking water or any facilities present as soon as july also wonder what the heroes would be represented at uh, Freyshoff and Tiershoff. So I am told that there will be drinking water available um, by July. We'll see. If there's not, we'll have a bunch of bottled water and stuff for people to use. It's going to be pretty rustic, not going to lie. Um, we don't have our facilities there yet, but what we are going to do is get a big pavilion tent set up where the great hall will eventually be. And we're also going to get a big tent set up where Tiershoff will eventually be. And we'll use those. There will be tables and chairs. We encourage people to bring chairs as well if we can. There's also, we'll figure out um, some porta potties. I think we'll try to do like two porta potties just in case. That'll be on site though, for sure. And um, other than that, it's going to be camping or figuring out your own accommodations. And that's that's factored in. Uh, Shane knows what I'm talking about though, because he was one of the first people out there with us when we when we first got it, when we had our first event there in July or in uh, January. And so, yeah, that's, that's what we're going to have on site. We're going to be doing, you know, potluck kind of food there for Saturday. And we'll we'll get that that all figured. But yeah, it's gonna it's gonna be rough. It's gonna be rustic camping for folks that want to. So please dress and pack accordingly. But it's gonna be awesome, and I'm really really looking forward to it. Uh, one of the big things we're looking forward to do is uh, get out there and do some work on the cemetery that's there. So it turns out um, there's a very old family cemetery that's on the property, and it actually has a uh, Revolutionary War veteran who's who's buried there. So we're going to try to take care of that as we do with, you know, with our stuff. We want to take care of that site and repair anything we need to repair, replace things that might need to be replaced. And I plan to bring my mother's ashes and uh, her tombstone's already down there in the state of Tennessee. We'll get that over there, and I'd like to put her... Uh, her ashes to rest there as well. Um, and the last question that we have currently, how do we participate in the Elsie bloat from afar and what time and date? Sarah, what can you tell us about it? Um, the bloat at Elsie Fest will be around 11 a.m. Central Standard Time. Elsie Fest tends to run pretty close on time, but then some things do happen. So it'll be around that time. So wherever you are, whether it's just you yourself or if you're around a group of people, just raise a horn to Elsie or have a little ritual to her. Um, I see James in the chat uh, suggested calling upon Odin and raising a horn to the folk mother. Um, take a picture of it, share it with some way with either me and James, and we'll put it in the homi the the video that we'll put together for Elsie Fest. All right, there you have it. And if everybody has like a, you know, we're going to be trying to do that at 11. Um, I'd say for good measure, if you want to make sure that you're hitting it at the same time, we are Make sure you're doing something by 11.05, 11.10. Um, but I'd just probably aim for doing something at 11.05. But I will be there and I will do my best to make sure we are, we are making it happen right at 11. I will be obnoxious if I need to, because it'll be cool if we can synchronize this as best as we can. It would be. Um, I think we are about out of questions, but I see one question from James. Uh, has Elsie had any influence on anyone else in the world? I'm sure she has. Um, specifically, I think James wants me to mention the Odinistas in Spain. Um, James has talked to, to the leader of them 
and and I don't know a lot about them. Uh, but at one point, their Wikipedia page claimed they had 10,000 members. So I, I don't know what that's all about. They have a beautiful um, stone area. Uh, I don't know if they call it a hof or a temple. Uh, it is absolutely gorgeous. And they have a memorial to Elsie Christensen there. Um, at some point in Elsie's life, while she was living in the United States, they had reached out to her and asked for her permission to practice Odin Odinism. And um, she gave it to them. I don't know why that was a thing. There isn't a lot written on that. Um, if James was on, he could probably talk about it more, but that's what I know. So, yeah, and I know very little bit about it either. I've, I've been talking to James about it and I know that it exists over there. Um, Comunidad de Odinista España. And it would be awesome if they have 10,000 members. That would be fantastic. Highly skeptical of, uh, of that number. But yeah, um, their connection with the folk mother was is very important to them. And they have a, a really cool, and you can find this on, uh, I don't know the address of it, paganplaces.com. Um, maybe Nick can figure that out before the end of our broadcast. I don't know, but they're a place that lists our Hoffs as well. And they have a really neat like stone ritual area that they have set up and a really cool um, stone like altar thing for the folk mother that has the Odinist logo on it. It's really neat. Uh, it sounds they like they have, good... go ahead. They also have a Facebook page that is incredibly active and a very beautiful website. Um, obviously, it's in Spanish, but you can translate it. There you go. And, you know, I don't officially endorse it because I don't know stuff about it. I always see over on the side. I did, in fact, neglect to answer all of your questions, Shay. I apologize about that. Um, so, Freyshoff, I don't know. That's a discussion we're going to have to have with the Freyshoff leadership when we get closer to getting that happening. Um I know who it will not be. It will not be a Thaneric, the king of the Goths, because that will be at Tearshoff. Um, and I think that hits the last of our questions. Sarah, you've been aware of all we've talked about tonight and all the questions that have been asked. What else do people need to know about the folk mother, Elsie Christensen? Sometimes when we talk about the pioneers of the past, um, we think of them as, as something far away in, in the past. We forget that they are real people. And I think it's very important, especially with Elsie, but all our heroes, all, all the people we do remember in stays too, that they were real flesh and blood people, just like your relatives, just like your mom and dad, and they should be treated and honored as such. And I think that is a very important thing to remember as we, as we talk about them and we speak their name out loud, that that is important. They are real and they were humans and, and they're just like you and me. So it's really, I'm really glad that you said that. Um, we have another question that popped up and we'll get to it, but In Alcatru, we have people that are obsessed with history, be it Viking history or history of, of different time periods. This draws a lot of people that are very fascinated by history. It is imperative that when we study history, we realize that these people are real people. When we celebrate acts of violence, we need to remember this was violence inflicted on actual human beings. Mm -hmm. When we celebrate warriors, they felt the same fears and the same hurt and the same struggle that any modern warrior would face. Mm -hmm. 
they certainly had a different social context for it. But these things are hard to do. We look at heroes and the further back in time, it's as if they're characters. They're not. They're actual people who have the same pieces that you and I have, the same brain that you and I have. Different cultural context, absolutely. But they went through the same struggles that we did. Their acts of greatness and their acts of heroism that earn them that place of honor aren't because they are superhuman. It's because they are human and they willed themselves to rise to super levels. They went through the same struggles that we all face and they were able to overcome. But realizing that and realizing the difficulty that is for a real flesh and blood person, as opposed to a, a pretend hero, is essential. Their heroism isn't just in the fact that they were amazing. It was in the fact that they were regular and chose to become amazing through hard work, through dedication, through boldness, through, through whatever method. They ascended to something beyond what you and I are because of their willpower, because of their determination to do so. And that's what we're celebrating. Yes. Um, and we are all capable of that because you have to remember as you're living your life every day, we are our future ancestors. Someday that could be us they're talking about, maybe not on that magnitude, but we are important to the ones that come after us because we will be the ancestors. You know, hell, maybe, maybe of that magnitude. The, don't, sell your, possible. don't sell yourself short. That's the thing. Heroism is about overcoming. We all start wherever we start. But heroism through ascension is about becoming more than you are through your deeds. And your deeds are a reflection of your will. Are you able to overcome your circumstance? We talked uh, with Witt and Swan a few weeks ago about Orlog. Some of us are dealt a crappy hand. Some of us have more or different things to overcome. But whether or not you achieve heroism or ascension, can you overcome the hand you were dealt? Can you be more than that? The answer is yes, you can. Will you? That's up to you. But um, that potential, that seed of greatness is inherent in our folk. Um, so the next question, Sarah, what's the best way for women to participate in Alistair Troop? Thank you. To show up, to to come with your significant other, to come on your own, show up, and and look to the examples of the women that are already there. The I had mentioned that my first experience with the AFA was the Northern Blood Kindred, and Jessica Hansen and Githia Anna Plord. Honestly, when I went up there, I expected it to be like like other events that I had been to where the women are in the kitchen and the men are out there bloating and doing whatever men do. And it wasn't like that at all. We were active participants at one point during the bloat, which I had never experienced a group bloat before other than, you know, we had had our family bloats, but I had never experienced that before. And Anna handed me the bowl. And it's like, I, I want you to do the blessing. And I was like, oh my goodness. And it was just such a powerful thing from everything from the women blessing the horn to Anna running the ceremony to us all being a part of it. It was an amazing thing. So show up and you will be welcomed and, and you will be talked through it if you've never experienced before. And it is worth it because you have a place in Asa True too. So that's really important. Um, one of the most 
one of the most special things that I've seen in Alistair True in the last, you know, few years, certainly in the last time, uh, my time as Alistair Harrier Gofi, but this was going on before that. The women and the families. Um, I first got involved in Alistair True in 2001 and uh, maybe even 2002. And at that time, even at that relatively late date, um, it was a lot of dudes. It, it was a lot of guys and maybe their Wiccan girlfriend or something they might bring around, but a lot of guys. In the last 20 years, we've seen it be about families, about the whole folk, about our elders, about children. We have been so blessed with children in the AFA over the last seven years. And I am so thankful for that. Um, Sarah mentioned at the at the top of the show about the generational aspect of Alcatraz. Yeah. And at Odenshof, we have a family now that uh, they're bringing up their their young children, and those young children are third generation AFA. And that that's what we're doing. That's what we're building is our future. Um, Sarah also mentioned about our homeschool pro program, the Austro Academy. Um, we just are, we're winding down here on the last days of our kindergarten program for that very first year. And that's been amazing. Uh, that's been great for parents and for those children. And we're so excited. We're going to have registration open up for kindergarten through third grade for this fall. And that's going to be huge. We've got so many people interested already. Please, if you are interested, if you have children who are going to be, you know, going into kindergarten through third grade, please consider signing them up with the Austro Academy. It does mean you have to be members of the AFA. It's important for us to control our curriculum that the kids are in families that are officially AFA members. But it's something I'm so proud of. And it it is less sparkly and eye-catching than each of our new Hoffs, but it is more important than each of those Hoffs individually, the fact that we now have a program to homeschool our children and to raise the next generation of AFA members. Um, watching the family involvement and having my own family involved in the AFA is such an amazing, amazing thing. And it wasn't the norm just 20 years ago, but it is now. And uh, I'm, we're so blessed to have that. Uh, next question, and we're, we keep trickling in these questions here. Have you all signed into the Folk Mother's Gravesite website? So I'm assuming that James is talking about on Find a Grave. If he is, Nick, I sent you the address to her spot where you leave flowers on the Find a Grave. So if you can throw that up there, I know many of you have, I have, um, yeah, go by and show anybody who looks that, that people care and it's a nice little free thing you can do to just show your appreciation and do something nice for Elsie. And I appreciate you mentioning that, James. That's a really easy thing for people to do, but it's, it's an important thing. It's a nice thing. Um, so, so I don't speak this, but I'm going to do my best. Uh, question, Sarah, have you played Knifetoffel? Uh, there is a digital app version in real life. Oh, okay. Have you played Knifetoffel digital app version or in real life with a kinsman? Have you ever played no. that, sir? No, I never have. I, I'm not really sure what that one is. So it's the chess. It's the proto chess. Oh, um, okay. I've watched people play it. Where you've they got the queen on the inside okay. and then you have people coming in from the outside. I am currently undefeated at that game. Just putting okay. that out there. My my und my amazing undefeated win loss record is I have won one, I have lost zero. 
but I'm going to still claim it as being undefeated because it's true. Um, so, yeah, and if uh, if anybody wants to challenge me at uh, LC Fest, don't sing it, bring it. Um, this is an interesting question. We do have one more question that popped up. This isn't related to Elsie, but I have a question. What is one word that you would use to sum up Odin? Sarah, what's one word you'd use to sum up Odin? Wise. Uh, ecstasy is the word I would use. That's my one word that would sum up Odin. Um, and not... Not in a strange interpretation of it, but the ecstatic state that one gets through through spirituality. I've mentioned this before, but the coolest thing as a Gothi is seeing when all of a sudden people have that moment where this is real and they are in a place where their eyes are as wide as plates and they are in a, literally an ecstatic state because the gods have become real to them. And you can't count on seeing that every time, but seeing that, those moments, that is ecstasy. And that's the word that uh, most symbolizes the All Father to me. Um, so next question, and I'm just looking on the side in the chat here. I know I'm kind of up jumping Nick on the questions here, but that's okay. What's y'all's favorite board game? Mine is Hinta. I have no idea what that is, uh, Shay, but I'm curious to hear about it. Um, Blocus is also fun. Again, another game I've never heard of. Sarah, what's your favorite board game? I enjoy playing Trivial Pursuit. Um, we used to play a lot of Monopoly in our household with the older children, but that got banned from the house because that board got tossed across the room too many times. <laughs> So I like Trivial Pursuit. It's a good game. Um, I also really like this game called Taboo. And it's one of those, you know, you've get a, you're trying to get your partner to guess a word and you've got certain words under it you can't use. It's kind of like Pictionary, but with words. I'm all about it, but I get really intense. Um, I feel bad because me and my friends used to get together and have board game night all the time. Me and my buddy Adam we would just dominate if we were on a team. We would destroy people. But man, on taboo, I don't care about anybody's feelings. I go hard. I get the I get people to answer the questions, but I may not make a lot of friends on it because I, I go hard on the taboo. Um, and I think that officially is our last question of the night. Sarah, thank you so much for joining us. I am looking forward to seeing you here. Probably not till Friday morning, but uh, yeah, I'm very much looking forward to seeing you. Thank you so much for coming on and talking about the folk mother. But beyond that, thank you so very much for honoring Elsie and being such a driving force in that. We really appreciate it. So I get a, a rando thing here that everybody does need to remember. Please like and share and subscribe to all these things. It affects all the algorithms and all the stuff on whatever you watch this on, whatever you hear this on. If you hear this as a um, as a podcast on Spotify after Friday, or if you're watching this on Odyssey or YouTube or Entropy or uh, VK or uh, or Twitter. All those little likes and shares and subscribes and stuff, those really help our algorithm. They help our our uh, reach to get out there to folks that may want to hear this, may want to listen and, and learn from this or participate with this next time. So please do those things. It's been fantastic to talk with all of you. Uh, I hope you guys have an amazing night. And uh, until next time, hail the gods, hail the folk, hail the AFA. And remember... Victory never sleeps.